So, uh, y y you ever get really high, do your homework, not remember doing your homework because you were really high, and then turn it in anyway, j just to see what would happen? Well, that's not the story in this movie, but it is the story of this movie. Got your attention? Good, because this is going to need some setup. Come with me, brother. Take my hand. It seems today you hear a lot about filmmakers, or quote-unquote showrunners, supposedly hijacking a project and turning it into something it was never meant to be, the accusation usually being aimed at creators from <clears throat> certain backgrounds who've been hired onto big franchise IPs and then changing them to push an agenda, which, yes, is the outlook, understanding, and language, if you can call it that, of people who barely even qualify as people in the evolutionary sense of the word, but for sake of argument, does that scenario or anything like it ever actually happen? because it's one of those dumb ideas that even though you can generally assume that it's not happening because that's just not how movies or anything works. Oh, wait a second, I thought Banky and Holden created this shit. And I'm stealing it. I'm taking it back for the black man to make up for all the shit that you motherfuckers have taken from us. Like they don't just have whole finished movie or TV shows all planned out and then some purple-haired woke boogie woman out of Ben Shapiro's self-hating dry dream fetish nightmare tricks someone into hiring them and then she injects the liberal queer genes into it and it becomes a whole other thing just before it gets to air and no one else in the studio or business at any point in the production knows anything about it, can prevent it if they wanted to. Like, that, that's just not how anything works, but it almost if you squint and then hit yourself in the head enough, sounds like a version of it might possibly in some stupid universe be plausible, right? Like, maybe you'd even like it to be plausible or possible in one direction or another for a particular creative person with a particular vision to take over a production and covertly turn it into their own thing as a way to get their vision out or send a message or even just to fuck with people for the hell of it. You know, like in the third act of Tim Burton's Ed Wood movie, where Ed essentially tricks the investors of Plan 9 into making the movie in order to realize his own vision and honor the memory of Bela Lugosi after getting a pep talk from Orson Welles. That's almost total fiction, by the way. That's a great movie, probably still Tim Burton's best, but it has very little to do with what's known of Ed Wood's real life, the production of Plan 9, which is fine, it's not really a biography, but yeah. You know, there's the famously contentious making of Apocalypse Now, where Francis Ford Coppola's finished movie was very different than its tone and politics from John Milius' original script, and during the production, they kept shooting deeper and deeper into the jungle, in part to prevent the studio from seeing what they were doing and stopping them, and the director and editor were at one point holding pieces of the footage hostage from each other, that was a whole thing. But yeah, the, the woke hijacking thing, that, that just doesn't happen. And it doesn't. There's no real meaningful precedent for a movie where the production set out to deliver some rock-ribbed, all-American, traditional values, stalwart vision, only for it to be seized, for better or worse, by a sneaky trickster filmmaker at the helm manipulating the final product into something exactly the opposite, and then it's too late to do anything. There's just too many different levels of yes and no to sign off on, even the smallest production, for it to work like that. This is why, again, better or worse, the most common complaint about big Hollywood movies today, from the people who know what they're talking about at least, isn't that they're bad or incompetent, but that they're bland and boring, that they go through too much quality checking and double checking, so that while they're too polished to be actually all that bad, they're too second guessed to be truly great. We're not really drowning in shit, but we are treading water in lukewarm good enough. It's not that good, but it's not that bad. It's so so. Yeah, more or less. Thing is, I actually do know of exactly one, exactly one movie where a filmmaker really was supposedly hired on to develop and direct a film based on a famous intellectual property, literally ran off during pre-production to do some other stuff before returning, committing, and completing the actual movie, after which the studio and producers discovered they should have been paying much closer attention to what he'd been doing between I'm gonna go on walkabout before we make this and I'm back, rested, and I got this, guys, because what he delivered no longer bore hardly any resemblance to the material they'd paid to adapt and instead was a lengthy treatise on the filmmaker's newly awake but very committed, ideological and spiritual beliefs rendered with very expensive special effects. I see. I see. My memories. <laughs> ah! You 
ruin my song. But now here's the thing. This cinematic hijacking, the one and only time a rogue creator took a whole production and warped not only the film itself, but the beloved property it was based on into a whole other thing, reflecting their personal obsession and crusade, not about woke politics or unwoke politics or internet drama. So what was it about? Like, what did happen here? Drugs? Drugs. I'll have to say drugs too. Yep, specifically ayahuasca, aka dimethyltryptamine, aka DMT. I did DMT three times in a day. Wow. It, it fucked me up for a, a while. Before it was giving Spence's gifts a second lease on mall profitability and podcasters brain damage, it was fucking up 2004's Blueberry, an adaptation of one of the most famous and long-running and widely read comic book properties across Europe, it's originally from France, that this movie, to date, the only movie ever to have been officially made from this, despite the property being over 60 years old, published in dozens of languages across 27 volumes continuously from 1963 to 2007, has fuck all to do with. Because the director, Jan Conan, best known for Doberman in 1997 and this career flame out pretty much, signed on to make it, started developing it, then took a trip to Peru to make a documentary about the use of psychedelics in traditional indigenous shamanic ritual medicine and uh, well, when he got back to France, it was pretty much, hey, 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 hey guys, nobody freak out, but like, I know what the movie and also everything else really needs to be about man. It's time to go. So to understand how absurd all this playing out is, you kind of need the context that most American audiences, maybe most English-speaking audiences, seems to be the case, period, just didn't have for this, since the franchise, while a massively popular and fairly traditional Western through and through, has mostly had its popularity in the non-English-speaking world. The original comics version is basically a frankification of very classical cowboy serials and Western comics tropes, refiltered through two of the greatest, if not the two greatest, French comic creators of all time, writer Jean-Michel Chalier and Jean-Henri Gaston Girard, aka Mobius, yes, that Mobius. It would take a whole other video to summarize the Blueberry series, and longer than that for me to fill in and fact check all the parts I don't know, because, uh, je ne suis pas très doué pour parler ou comprendre la française, pardonnez-moi, grammaire. Quoi? Mais je vais te... So, in the broad strokes, originally spun out of what was meant to be an ensemble serial, Blueberry is about a guy named Mike who renames himself Blueberry after the plant as a symbolic break from his past as a racist farmer in the American South who dedicates his life to fighting hatred and discrimination after his life is saved by a former slave, first becoming a soldier in a fight against the Confederacy in the Civil War, and then traveling the American West as a sometime lawman, sometime vigilante, sometime general cowboy hero, standing up for the rights of the oppressed and downtrodden, and in particular fighting specifically on behalf of wronged Native Americans. Over the course of the series, Blueberry encounters both fictional and real Old West characters as friends and enemies, thwarts assassination plots, and seeks hidden treasure, tracks serial killers, bandits, and vengeful military men, all while trying to keep peace between ever-uneasy settlers and indigenous peoples across a not exactly realistic, but also not wholly mythological version of the American West as envisioned with a historically critical but also clearly enamored of the mythology overview from creators looking at it from across a literal and figurative ocean of perspective distance. All right, yeah, that, that sounds pretty good, right? Like, that's a nice, solid, bases loaded, no out setup to at least get a runner in. I mean, you'd have to try to fuck this up. So here's how they fuck this up. To be clear, the filmmakers wanted this to be a huge hit. They even opted to shoot it in English so it could go theatrical in the United States, commissioned a screenplay built loosely around the Lost Dutchman's Mind story arc, generally considered to be among the best, if not the best, Blueberry storylines from the comics, and at one point started to sign Val Kilmer to play Marshall Mike Blueberry. It's probably best that he did not do that, but considering the last time he did a cowboy movie it was Tombstone, one of the best cowboy movies ever made, I mean, couldn't have hurt. Instead, it's Vincent Cassell playing Blueberry, who they mostly call Mike here, with his family back background, I guess, shifted from Georgia to Louisiana to explain the accent and the French continuing to vastly overestimate how much Americans were going to like this guy to explain why else Vincent Cassell is here. I mean, he's fine, I guess. The rest of the cast is filled out by a murderer's row of good actors whose presence nonetheless tells you you're about to watch a bad movie mainstays. <laughs> Oh, do you think I'm exaggerating? Was that a little mean? Well, here they are. Red flags assemble. Cheki Cario, Jaiman Hansu, Tamora Morrison, Ernest Bordnine, Juliette Lewis, Eddie Izzard, Michael Madsen, Cole Meany. Yeah, you see what I mean? All good actors, all been in good movies, but if you see like two to three of any of these names together on one poster and there's not a Tarantino in sight, it's probably not going to be very good. 
want to know what I saw in the fire? I saw... Funny shapes. This dentist break fire to kill me! Either way, apart from mostly being named for various characters in the Blueberry comics, none of them, not even Cassell, have really anything to do with their namesake or where they supposedly came from, which is the other reason why I didn't need to tell you much about the source material. Basically, none of it is in here. Anti-racist origin story, ideological transformation, roots in the historic background of the American Civil War and westward expansion. Hell nah, man, we got drug stuff to do. So, in this new origin story, Mike Blueberry is a pampered kid sent to his uncle out west for some toughening up. You ask me, he was let too long to suck on a nigger pap. His uncle's got a ranch in a town called Palomito. Well, maybe he can put some starch in the bar. Who falls in love at first sight, not even really first sight, first glance, first pan up via composite shot really, with the prettiest prostitute in cowboy land and by the law of western cliches immediately gets in over his head opposite Michael Madsen as our outlaw villain and arch nemesis for the piece, Wally Blount. <sighs> you want to see how a man does it? Go, go Mike. He'll kill you. You don't want to die over no horror. Oh. No. There's a fight, a fire, and just like that... Mike has an instant dead girlfriend backstory to be nursed back from by some Apache medicine men. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be one of those. Skip ahead a few years, way too many shots of actors just sitting around with apparently some actual ayahuasca shamans the director brought on for the production, which does admittedly sound classier than letting your dealer be in the movie, and some more trippy chanting and bird's eye shots because these were expensive before they invented drone cameras and we're gonna show the shit out of them, and Mike is now Marshall Mike Blueberry, looking after a town of colorful eccentrics and character actors barely keeping the peace between an ever-increasing influx of settlers and European explorers who think there's gold in them there hills and the natives who live in them there hills and would rather just continue doing so. I know about the Prussians' map to them damn mountains. You shouldn't get caught up in this nonsense, Craig. You don't want to lose what you got. Father, we should get going. Also, Juliette Lewis is here, acting alongside her dad, Jeffrey Lewis, also playing her character's father. He used to do a lot of spaghetti westerns back in the 60s and 70s. That's kind of interesting and should have happened in a better movie. I told you that horse won't listen to anybody but me. Uh, she's playing Maria, the feisty, take-no-bullshit, smart, somehow last-unmarried hot gal in town who's only got eyes for Marshall Mike, but of course he's still barely functional, psychologically, because his psyche's all tore up about not stopping Blount from killing the girl in the fire, and he has nightmares and blames himself and we never see the whole incident, and they do draw this out for the whole fucking movie. Anyway, our epic more than just a western plot set up here is meant to be that while Mike is trying to keep the peace between the natives and the town over an all but inevitable shooting war over gold waiting to be mined that may or may not exist, the situation gets upended by Eddie Azar, Jaiman Hansu, and the sordid other dudes to get shot before they do as treasure hunters who think what's hidden in the native sacred mountains isn't simply gold deposits but some more specific literal buried treasure, like an El Dorado kind of deal. Father Del Rio, may you be blessed in heaven! <laughs> oh, also, Blount is still alive. Most folks just call me Wally. I mean, you knew that was coming, but yeah, he's back, and if there's a non-ironic reason to watch Blueberry, it's to see Michael Madsen give somehow the most hinged version of an unhinged bad guy performance ever. I wish I was a spider. If I was a spider, you would squash my head. Yes. You would squash my little black head. Better go run and find your mommy, okay? Animals are beasts. 
But men are monsters. I'm trying to save my animal spirit. Uh, Blount wants the golden treasure of the Superstition Mountains too, but he's also clearly fried his brain somewhere between gifting Blueberry his origin motivation, and now when there's implications that he's a white sorcerer who's cracked the code of Indian magic or something, and the treasure is some powerful thing he shouldn't get his hands on, which, okay, alright, that's also not necessarily a bad idea, but also, once again, none of this is from the fucking Blueberry comics. I'm not in the book! <laughs> Like, none of this. The Lost Dutchman Mine is just an actual Old West folklore thing about some especially good gold mine that no one can find again, and Blount is just some fucking guy who kills a lot of people before one of the other bad guys offs him in kind of a random way. Which is not a conceptual criticism on my part, really, just illustrating how far of a walk they're taking to get where they're going. And it goes on like this. Uh, where they're going is for Blueberry to chase Blount into the mountains after a couple more kills and some violence puts everything on a path to open conflict between the town and the Indians, and Mike basically throwing away his martial responsibilities to go have this likely suicidal vengeance showdown with Blount because he has to avenge that girl he knew for a couple minutes. Uh, Maria goes off with a posse in pursuit. They find these secret treasure caves, I guess, where it turns out the golden treasure is... Do you want to guess? We've all already figured this out, right? Drugs? Drugs? I'll have to say drugs, too. Yeah, really good drugs. That's our big twist. Th there's no gold nuggets or buried golden trinkets or jewels or whatever. The treasure is that this is the cave where the native shamans keep and use all their top shelf sticky icky, bruh. You are so stoned, man. You wake and bake every day. And by the time Mike gets there for the showdown, Blount is already tripping balls. Get up. And he didn't bring Mike here to fight, he wants him to sample the goods too. Maite is to do it the ape, shimwagi pudukai. Okay, now, now I know I've been having a bit of fun here with the plot description, guys, but I need you to hear and understand me that I am not making one word up about this finale. This is what we've been building up to and how the movie's big climax actually plays out. Mike and Wally Blount are not gonna fight. Ooh, that's bad. We're deliberately subverting the hero-villain gunfight showdown trope in favor of spiritual warfare. That's good. In which they will settle their conflict in the realm of the heart and mind. That's bad. Conceptualized as an epic clash between the forces of madness and reason for control of Mike Blueberry's very sanity and his darkest secrets. That's good. Visualized in the form of an irritating Frenchman describing his definitely life-changing DMT trip via almost 10 solid minutes of early 2000s kaleidoscope CGI animation. That's bad. No, really, this is the movie, and to be totally clear on this point, they are not bullshitting. Blount doesn't have magic powers, the shamans don't have sorcery beyond whatever dumb bullshit people like Kunin and Rogan and other dipshits think DMT does for them. This isn't supposed to be like a movie drugs thing where the ayahuasca is gonna jack them into the peyote matrix and this is them having a wizard's duel. This is meant to be our more sophisticated, elevated A24 if A24 was a thing back then, better, smarter, more enlightened twist on the gunfight ending to this western. We've known each other for quite some time. It's time to go. You're a dead soul. You're not welcome here. I see why I'm here now. To bring you with me. I see why we met the first time. 
the good guy and the bad guy getting high as hell on DMT together, and Blount is the more experienced user who's apparently figured himself out after doing so much of this talking Mike through tripping balls therapy so he can recover repressed memories and heal himself. So what is Mike repressing? Come with me, brother. Take my hand. Speak with me in deep tongues, the language of the dead. Yeah, that's it. That That's our last big shocking twist here. Mike actually was the one that messed up all those years ago and was responsible for shooting the girl in the fight, and that's why he's been so miserable and depressed this whole time, because he couldn't admit it to himself. And Blount came all this way. You know, I'm sorry, I fail to see how this still isn't at least equally his fault, given he was still doing a sexual assault at the time. Sweet little Madeline. It was you, Mikey. But, okay, fine, whatever. The, the tripping still just keeps going after this. Like, for a while, they just keep showing us this shit. Because apparently this is what Kunan saw when he first took the stuff in Peru and it changed his fucking life. And then Mike wakes up and he feels better about himself, he takes a nude swim with Maria, and yeah, that, that's Blueberry. What the fuck?! They show us an eagle, there's more chanting, they do the flyover shots again, and yeah, that's uh, no, I'm not, I'm not kidding, that's the whole thing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that one really stung. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a tough stung. one, isn't it? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Boy, I'd hate to meet this movie in a dark alley some night, huh? <laughs> yeah, sure, whatever. Dark alley hey, um, bad. Tom, you what? got a little, uh... Don't, you... no, don't. No, really, don't, you don't, got don't, a little... No, just stop it, okay? Just stop it! <laughs> Uh, so people were not thrilled with this. Uh, you're shocked, I can tell. Uh, Jean-Michel Chalier had been dead for many years by the time it came out, but his son actually tried to have his father's name taken off it, but they told him he couldn't without foregoing royalties, which uh, probably wouldn't have made a difference because nobody bothered to see this. Mobius was more open to it, I believe. Uh, he has a walk-on cameo in there somewhere. Critics across the regions where they did bother opening this eviscerated the thing, and Conan has not made a film of any real significance since. I messed up my entire life Good because I got high. Like, he's worked, but not on anything anybody cared about and certainly not the scale where the French movie biz was clearly priming him back before this came out where he was going to be the next big crossover guy like Christophe Gans right after Pac de Loup. Uh, when it did finally release in the US it went directly to video and they did everything they could to market it as anything other than what it really was. Retitling it as just Renegade with a cover where you can barely tell Castell is even himself and he's holding up a rifle with this generic tagline The Devil You Know. I remember either working at a Blockbuster or a Suncoast when this came out and I want to say Blockbuster because I remember people bringing it back really pissed off, and who could blame them? I pray to God to give me the strength to make it back. So I could kill you. Uh, it goes without saying that it did not do anything to make the Blueberry comic franchise any more popular or even well known in the US than it ever has been, which is to say, not really at all, even still. And as you might expect, the only context that anyone ever talks about this now is, yeah, other dipshits who are huge into DMT who think it's fucking brilliant and that you should at least watch the trip parts on YouTube so you can get a feel for the truth of the universe, bro. <sighs> Thank you.
Uh, look, I'm not here to dismiss the concept of psychedelic transcendentalism outright or shit on anyone's sincerely held spiritual beliefs or even wholly disregard the so-called acid western as a subgenre as a whole. Yes, you guys in the comments who couldn't even be bothered to finish the fucking video, I was also myself and no film student, so I have in fact seen El Topo, and I'm certainly not against recreational drugs from some moral high ground or even a moral low ground for that matter, or wildly reimagining movie adaptations apart from source material, none of that. Everything going on here could theoretically work or even even when not working, at least have been interesting, compelling, entertaining, whatever. But this sucks. Funny, little black tongues licking my soul. That man shuffles his feet. You shouldn't be afraid to ride the sand. And I'm obligated to make these videos fun, and I feel like some of you will be induced to now watch Blueberry to find out if I'm making up how fucking nuts this is, and okay, have at it, but the thing is, the most bizarre aspect about it is how dull it is, despite how batshit insane it sounds when described. The hook of staging a rote, boilerplate, Old West hero villain revenge showdown story, where the big confrontation throws away the guns and opts for a hallucinogen-induced therapy session rendered in psychedelic CGI, sounds so crazy you'd at least think you'd wind up sitting there and stunned, mind-blown exhilaration either at how stupid this is, impressed that some absolute madman actually tried to pull it off, and you're watching an all-time cinematic car crash in real time, and instead it's just incredibly dull in the way that only something this profoundly wrong-headed but self-serious can be. because they really weren't kidding around here. Conan really did bring a full-fledged shaman onto the production. He appears on camera. That's apparently him on the soundtrack doing the fucking chanting. Supposedly part of what made the difference in getting Cassell the lead role was him also being big into this whole scene at the time, so he got it, I guess. Uh, oh, but in case you were curious, there is actually not any evidence that indigenous tribes in the American Southwest where this is taking place ever had access to ayahuasca. Uh, we see peyote plants at different points in the movie, but when the big trip stuff is happening, the sacred vines and the CGI are the uh, plant they get ayahuasca from, so they really didn't try that hard on the whole accuracy thing either, but they sure did remember to be pretentious about it. We should lead them to the Chiricahua. Can't you see how hard he fights to survive here? You have no respect for life. And that's what it all comes down to. For all the pretense to what this is supposed to mean and reveal that was supposedly worth this once promising director blowing up his career to hijack the film over, this is not, in fact, the most accurate recreation ever of the experience of psychedelic transcendental drug trip. What it is, is an extremely accurate representation of what it's like to watch some other douchebag get high and then tell you about how interesting it was. I did DMT three times in a day. Wow. It, it fucked me up for a a while. Did you ever see the back of a $20 bill, man? I was in many shapes before I was released. And I see. I see. There's a dude sitting in the bushes, man. Does he have a gun? I don't know, man. I don't know. What? What? Red team, go! Red team, go! It's annoying. It goes nowhere. It takes forever to get there. And you get nothing out of it. But it happened. It's there, you can't deny it, and unlike the truth that morons keep thinking they'll find at the end of their next DMT crash, this movie exists.